We're back live here at the Velocity Conference. If you want to contact us, go and use the hashtag Velocity Conference. Not Fluent Conference, I've been using the Fluent Conference. That's over, that was the JavaScript show we what did. That, that was a great conference. Uh, man, we, we did a good job there. We uh, had just dropped in in one day's notice. But this is the Velocity Conference. This is O'Reilly Media's Velocity Conference. This is the intersection of, of designing on the front end and back end, DevOps, Cloud Ops, application performance, web performance, whatever you want to call it. It's a really a hybrid show, really where the, the, the main alpha geeks are here, really building the next generation ops. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SilverLink. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante with design.org. Theo Schlossnagel is here. He's the C CEO of Omni TI um, and is a tech athlete, we like to call him. <laughs> and, uh, welcome back to theCUBE. Yeah, we like sports analogies here. <laughs> and, uh, so good to see you again. Thanks, good to be here. So, um, so what's new since the last time we talked to you? Oh, well, so um, still drowning in data. Um, <laughs> still you know, smothered by clouds and being rained on every day. I, I don't know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of the same. I think the, 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 the industry's matured a lot, so the conversations are better now, but, but uh, a lot of the same problems remain unsolved. So you are uh, obviously a big open source proponent and uh, have made you know, tons of contributions. See, it feels like the world is, you know, open source is obviously been here forever, but it feels like the enterprise world is starting to get it. Um, you know, you're seeing, you know, IBM's a recovering alcoholic, yeah. you're seeing HP bet the farm on OpenStack, even, you know, the likes of EMC, you know, the companies that are known for sort of propriety are starting to hop on the bandwagon. What, what do you make of that? Um. It's, I don't know, it's kind of an interesting convergence. Uh, I, I, I guess I've been a fan of open source, but more than anything I'm a fan of, you know, shit that works, <laughs> right? And th that's the most important part, is that, that you have actual solutions to actual problems that you face. And it, it turns out that when we started uh, the consulting company, Omni TI, back in 97, I, probably 80% of the stuff that we did was open source. And then over the next 10 years, that went to almost, uh, you know, probably you know, one out of 100 solutions is now commercial. Um, and it's just because the open source products scratch the itch better, right? There is a solution there. There's less technical risk in running open source. Um, you don't, you're not you know, beholden to a vendor to, to provide you updates uh, when things go wrong. And if you're on the bleeding edge of scalability, things always go wrong. Um, you're the one to witness them. You probably have, uh, have the best facilities to fix them. And if it's open source, you actually can. Um, so open source makes a lot of sense there. But I mean, even today, we still run a, a decent amount of, of closed source software. You had said as complexity increases, operations are abandoned in a perfect storm. I think you wrote that somewhere. <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what was the quote again? As complexity increases at scale, operations yeah. are abandoned in a perfect storm. So you, know, you, you did the first one that told us about, hey, it's, it's, it's not DevOps, it's Ops Dev. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that when, when complexity gets very, very large, right, and you're running things at scale, um, the discipline, uh, the, the, the person that can actually troubleshoot those skills isn't a single person, it's not an ops person, it's really a person that understands the entire stack, it's a software generalist. So like the traditions of this siloed approach of operations versus development versus whatever, um, they don't apply very well when you, when you have um, uh, s complex systems that are that large. So I got to ask you about um, some of the, the uh, quotes you said. You said on theCUBE, this is a strata, this is 2010, you said it's not about DevOps, it's about ops dev because ops really needs to tolerate, can't tolerate downtime where devs, you want to push and iterate the whole break stuff. And you know, ops, ops people don't like that. Um, but, but that was, was the first time on theCUBE we've heard that counter opinion, which we like because that really brings the reality to large scale enterprises, financial institutions, they need to have scale and they need reliability. So given then, we're next, next two years, what's stabilized in the DevOps world as it evolves? Has it stabilized, is it more the same? Has there any, any bright light with the cloud as it's still trying to, as enterprises still want to do on-prem and do cloud, all this bursting and public and private? Is there any stability? I think that the industry is coming to grips with the, the need for more generalized talent. Um, so that, that stabilized it. DevOps is no longer a term that you hear only at a conference. There are uh, 35 books on it now, right? So I think the awareness has gone up, so it's not a novelty. Um, so now there are mature conversations instead of just kind of r rather 
uh, immature ev evangelical conversations around it. Um, uh, so I, I've said a couple times at, at Velocity Conference that I serve as a, as a body check to those people that want DevOps or, or Ops Dev, right? There's so many software engineers that try to explain why software engineering has so much to contribute to operations. Well, they're having that side of the argument. I feel ne necessary to mention the other side of the argument, which is you need some operational skills in your software engineering because you just don't have them. Um, and then the same thing is true when I hear people talking about you know, instilling operational values in software engineering. I'm always trying to remind them, you know, there's a lot of software uh, engineering uh, practices and workflows and, and, and approaches to problem solving that are really applicable in, in operations. So it's, it's really just trying to be on the other side of the argument to make people get yeah. along. because So I was, talking to a C, I was talking to a CIO who, um, of a big insurance company, won't say the name, but their billion dollar operating budget on IT. Um, you know, obviously it's what it is, a competitive advantage for them, it's, you know, obviously insurance company, they want to have the data, mm -hmm. so they really want the big data, so he's, he says to me, hey, I, I got some POCs going on with Hadoop, we're looking at everything. They have challenges, they need compliance, it's, they have Red Hat here, they got this over there, so you have a lot of legacy baggage in these kind of rapid deployments. What's your, what, what's your experience been in the past year or two where these guys need to go there, they need to look at it, obviously there's material they can buy books and whatnot, but you know, as you're going there and consulting with these kinds of guys, what's the approach? What are you seeing working? What's not working? They obviously are want to get the emerging technology like Hadoop and store some batch and, and or use other technologies, but they got to scale up and scale out at the same time. So what are you seeing there? I mean, anything you can share? I, I mean, there's two strategies to that, um, and I think it really depends on an honest conversation about how well their heads are screwed on. Um, so the, the bigger companies, uh, a lot of times they have some really good talent internally um, that are progressive thinkers that, that, that realize that technology is there to, to meet business requirements and they don't have a kind of a, a silly um, a commitment or loyalty to a specific technology they're willing to shift around. And those companies, the advice really is, is yeah, you should explore all of these things. You should really look at them, you should evaluate them, you have the technical talent to evaluate these things from a good perspective. Um, then there are the other companies that are just like old, tried and true, IBMers from the old days. Not IBMs from today, but the IBMers from the old day. It's all, I have these business processes, I know these business processes, and the honest truth is they, they really shouldn't try everything. Someone needs to tell them to kind of stop yeah. and reset and you realize, you have to realize and come to grips with in order to go to the future and, and be able to use software as a service platforms and infrastructure as a service platforms and then deploy things quickly, you have to actually rid yourself of your previous workflows. You have to get rid of your the, the processes that you had in place and you have to pull in new ones. And from a consulting perspective in those situations, uh, it's almost always better to be highly prescriptive where you go in and you just tell them what to do. Yeah. Um, How does so. that relate uh, uh, to the, the business process piece of it, right? Because if you're going to, I mean, business processes connect into those IT development processes, right? So how do you sort of recommend that organizations the, deal with that? They're fundamentally distance? related. If they don't relate, you're going to fail, right? I mean, if there's, there's no reason to even have technology unless it's going to enable a business process. The problem is, is tech's not, technology is not nearly as flexible as people think it is. Technology is good at some things, it right. works in some ways. So understanding those and being willing to change your business processes to adapt to the strengths of technology is key, right? I mean, you're, otherwise your competitor's going to do it and blow you out of the water. So histor yeah, well, absolutely. So historically you've got this database and then you right. get these processes that are, are these technical processes built up around that database right. and then you sort of wire your business process to them because you have no choice. Right. And what you're sen essentially saying is, okay, that's, we get that, we understand why that's historically the case, but <laughs> you're going to get, you're going to be roadkill yes. if you don't change that. But there's a lot of, I would imagine, friction in making those changes. So how do you facilitate that change? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, as consultants and being, scare, a rather right? small, <laughs> as, as being rather small consultancy, we have about, we're just under 50 people. Um, we can't take on all the work in the world. So the customers that have their heads squarely you just walk. Uh, where the sun shines <laughs> are, we tell them, you know, you're not ready yet. You run, you don't You're walk. not ready yet. We're not here to convince you that you need to do this. You yeah. need to know you need to do this. We're here to help you not fall off the cliff while you're doing it. Right, those business processes, the big difference today is that technology enables business in a way that it has never done so before. Right, you have big data solutions that can answer crazy questions now. Um, but you have to ask the right questions and it's good at answering specific questions. 
So if your business process that you have maps onto the technology in a way that's really awkward and not very efficient, like there is a great reason to have those technologists, a technologist that's highly versed at the table helping design those business processes because suddenly you can make some small, very surgical changes to those and, and, and make them highly efficient and highly, much more powerful. Yeah, you know, we were at the ServiceNow conference a couple, actually last month, Jeff Frick and I were doing it, and it was amazing to see what they've done. I mean, it's a you know, small scale implementation of this, but they've got a, a single CMDB and they're able to completely change business processes around that, to your point. Um, and it was a real enabler, mm -hmm. and you get these IT guys jumping around, making cakes, you know, having <laughs> parties, because they're like the happiest IT people you've ever seen. Yeah. So, are you seeing that kind of enthusiasm in shops that you've touched? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on the culture of the company, I think, <laughs> I mean. No, these are hardcore IT guys, I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so <laughs> who, who, who are the students that, that, that act out most in college? It's the ones that went to the, to the restrictive Catholic, you know, girls' schools, right? I mean, so I think, I think that. That's Frank Zappa. That, that the, the IT organization <laughs> where, where, where IT was always a cost center, and they're always the underdog, and they're always the servant to that, like when they turn around and add value and everyone in the organization recognizes it, they have a reason to celebrate like no one else does, yeah, right? Because the, the, yeah. the difference, the contrast between where they were in, in, in their place and where they are as a player at the table, like is so radically different. The other more progressive organizations where IT's already having a good time, I would say the celebrations aren't quite that big, but, but uh, they're very rewarding. Right. Awesome. <laughs> Theo, always great to have you. We're going to try to get you on tomorrow as Thanks. well. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, we've got our next segment coming up. Always great to have you on. Uh, uh, colorful, knowledgeable, and uh, always having the, all, all the sides of the angles covered. So appreciate it. We'll be right back. This is Thank the Cube. We are at Velocity Conference, extracting the signal from the noise. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>